Good morning. Welcome to Focus on the Figure, a symposium about the Patty Canyon Ladies Salon. We want to acknowledge that we are on the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people, and we honor the path that they have always shown us in caring for this place for generations to come. And we at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture always like to add that art has always been a part of this place. So um, by way of an introduction, I'd like to, um, first of all, thank a few people, a few uh, entities that have made the symposium and this marvelous exhibition, which is in the, currently in the Paxson and Malloy galleries in the Part TV Center. Um, and the, uh, these individuals need to be thanked profusely for making this, uh, this effort coming, uh, come together. The first is, uh, and by the way, I'm Rafael Chacon. I'm the director of the, of the museum. I didn't introduce myself. Um, so we'd like to thank the Montana Arts Council for their generous uh, contributions to uh, everything we do at the, uh, at the museum. And we also would like to thank the Montana History Foundation. Um, they funded, uh, they provided funds for a, an oral history project of the Patty Canyon Ladies Salon. And we are very, we're deeply uh, grateful for that gift and also uh, very excited about the, the ultimate product, which you can actually access at the Montana Memory Project um, based in, uh, at the Historical Society in Helena. So if you just Google Montana Memory Project, Patty Canyon Lady Salon, you'll see some marvelous interviews with uh, the members and models of the, uh, the salon. Also, I want to thank uh, Shereen Newman, who was uh, the interviewer for that, uh, that wonderful project. And also there's a video that was also produced that has in part some of the, the quotes of the members, uh, the models and members of the salon. And I want to thank Eileen Rafferty, our videographer uh, in, at the museum, and Ted Hughes, our interim curator, for producing that, uh, that video. Um, there's also a very important person in the audience, and I would like you to, uh, as soon as I introduce him, I'd like you to uh, maybe uh, give a round of applause, and that is to Ron Erickson, who's sitting right here in the center. Ron's contributions uh, and support of this uh, exhibition and this symposium have been consistent, and so thank you, Ron. Uh, it's great to have you here this morning. Um, there are also two anonymous owners or two individuals who uh, have preferred not to be named who are also supporting our efforts. I also want to thank the curatorial team, and I know uh, most of you are here. Uh, that includes uh, uh, artist Stephanie Frostad, Christy Hager to my left, uh, Leslie Van Stavern Millar, uh, and Nancy Erickson, who in some ways catalyzed uh, this project uh, at the outset. Uh, this is our, the museum's first foray into community curating, and it's been just an utter delight working uh, with them for the last two years to curate this exhibition, to pull this entire project together, which is in some ways much more than just hanging art on a wall. It's been a, really an effort in, uh, in collecting history, gathering the sources, the resources, and the individuals all of whom have participated in this uh, marvelous uh, salon. Uh, so thank you to the team. Actually, could I have you guys stand up just so that everybody can, uh, can acknowledge you? There's Stephanie, Leslie, Christy. They've been the stalwarts of the, the curatorial team. And they were joined by MMAC staff members, uh, uh, curatorial, uh, our own curatorial team along the way. Uh, I also want to thank Joanna Yardley for this beautiful, beautiful catalog. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to take a look at this. We're selling it, by the way, in the lobby for $20, um, and we're taking only cash and checks. I apologize for that, but it's on sale until the end of the exhibition, so please avail yourself of this gorgeous, gorgeous uh, production. And I also want to thank all the people who were involved in making that happen, including the uh, curatorial team, but also uh, authors, uh, writers, uh, including Ron Erickson, Margaret Kingsland, whom you'll hear uh, from later this afternoon, uh, Beth Judy, and all the members of the Patty Canyon Lady Salon who tell us their stories in the catalog as well. So thank you for that beautiful effort on the part of, uh, of the entire team. So just a, a word about the logistics uh, for this morning. So first of all, make sure to silence your cell phones. This is being live streamed uh, currently, and it is also going to be recorded 
uh, the, the entire day's symposium. So you'll be able to access this uh, through Montana Community Access Television on their webpage uh, later on. So, um, so please uh, make sure that your phones are silent so that you don't interrupt the, the discussions. So the program uh, looks as follows. We will begin with the presentation from Christy and myself uh, talking about the, the history of a gender and the life model. So it's a, a PowerPoint presentation uh, that we're going to do jointly. And then we'll fo uh, that'll be followed by a question and answer session. So I would ask that you withhold your questions until we're done speaking. Then we'll have about 15 minutes to, uh, to take questions from the audience. We'll take a small break at that point, another 15 minutes, and then we'll come back to hear Leslie Van Staver and Millar uh, address the, uh, the history of the Patty Canyon Ladies Salon. Um, then we'll take a break for lunch, and that'll be an hour-long break uh, at 12.30. Uh, there, are, there will be box lunches, a uh, variety of, of, uh, of possibilities there in terms of your lunches, and those will cost $5, and we're only taking cash or check for those as well. Um, then there, uh, our panel discussion will take place this afternoon with both members of the salon and models, and that'll begin at 1.30, again followed by question and answer from you. Um, and, then, uh, and then at 3 o'clock, we will have an, a reception in the lobby of the PAR TV Center. And, and during that time, the members of the salon will also offer uh, gallery tours. So if you want to actually join them, they'll be taking you through the exhibition uh, at that point. So that's, the, uh, that's what's uh, on the agenda for today. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into this uh, topic of... Uh, the life model, figure drawing, and its history in, um, in the Western tradition. And first, it's important to have a, a, a series of underpinnings. What, has sort of, what, uh, un, what undergirds, if you will, the, uh, the discussion of the model, particularly the, uh, the, the nude figure or the naked figure, if you want to call it that. So we must understand, first of all, that most of the world's traditions are indeed patriarchal. That is, both in the West and beyond the Western tradition. Uh, and gender equity is a rare thing in patriarchal societies. That's a given, uh, and that's really the premise behind everything that we're discussing today. Um, there is, in fact, some societies where gender differentiation and sometimes gender disparity exists, and that's also very much a part of patriarchal systems. In other words, men have roles, women have roles, and, uh, and, and those are more, than off, more often than not are kept apart. Or, or distinct from each other. And there is often disparity in who gets to be on top, particularly in terms of management of power. Western art, the, the Western artistic tradition is primarily patriarchal and misogynistic, and that tradition places women in a secondary role. That is the god-awful truth of it. Uh, for at least the last uh, 3,000 years, that's what we've seen in the Western world, if not uh, longer than that. Um, Western art, is primarily by men for men. And that's also a truism that we have to understand. And it tends to uh, reinforce this idea of women being secondary, subservient uh, to men. And often, those, um, th that relationship is enforced through violent myths. And those myths come to us from both the Greco-Roman tradition as well as the, uh, the Judeo-Christian myths. They almost always continue to reinforce this idea that women are, in fact, in a secondary role in society. So women in the eyes, and this is the, the, the tragedy of the Western tradition, is that women in the eyes of male artists, particularly straight male artists, are often objectified. That is, they're treated as objects, not as subjects. And they're portrayed as less than equal, often culpable, particularly for the great sins. For example, the fall, the original fall in, in the, in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, women are held culpable, or they're perceived as weak, often as indolent, and sexually available and or dangerous to males. So this is the grim reality that we have to, in some ways, understand. So I mentioned this idea, this concept of parity that is between the genders, and that is actually quite a rare thing in global traditions uh, universally. Patriarchy, because of its kind of global extent, historical patriarchy, uh, there, is, there are examples of visual parity, but often you have to step outside of the Western world to find them. For example, I'm showing you two, an example of visual parity between men and women, but it's also very clear here that what we also have is gender differentiation 
and, uh, and distinct roles for both the male and the female. So this is a case, uh, an African example, and here's an American example, an indigenous American example, of that sense of, again, gender differentiation. So we, we, we have visual parity, but the societies themselves were not equal. That is, the genders were not equal in the society. Another thing that is true is that we in the West uh, have been rather prudish about open, openly discussing the, the question of sexuality. And of course, sexuality is different from, from gender. But you have to step, in some ways, outside of the West to find a, a, a very different relationship to sexuality than what we have, uh, the uptightness that we often see in the West, or the boundaries, the well-established boundaries that we see in the Western world. So non-Western traditions for uh, ancient America often have a kind of frankness to both male and female sexuality that is rare to find in the Western world. And in the Western world, by the way, we codify them into this thing, that, this category we call the erotic. And by the way, Christy, please jump in at any, at any point. So, okay, so this is more typical of what we see in the Western world. That is, in fact, not, not only gender differentiation, but the idea that the female is inferior or subservient to, uh, to the male. That these are the archetypes that we have inherited in the Western world. And that is consistently reinforced over and over and over and over again in our patriarchal Western world. So again, here, this may look to us like visual parody, but if you actually spend any time with this painting, you'll understand that the woman is indeed in a, in a secondary, in a state of, of being a secondary to, to the male. Uh, this is the very famous painting uh, by Jan van Eyck of Giovanni Arnolfini and his bride. Uh, a a well-studied uh, uh, image, uh, mostly from the 20th century, that is. It's an older image, but uh, well-studied in the 20th century in terms of its gender relationships. And again, gender arch archetypal gender relationships are reinforced uh, consistently in the Western world, even into relatively uh, modern uh, days. Okay, an image like this is, is quite interesting because we see how myths uh, have, have been very useful to maintaining the patriarchy and, in fact, keeping men in control. For example, here, the male is seen as the protagonist, the, the hero, the Christian knight on horseback. This is, of course, St. George defeating evil in the form of the dragon. And notice that the female here is, in fact, the victim or the sacrificial victim. It's only through her sacrifice that evil will ultimately be de defeated. So again, woman is ut useful in a kind of utilitarian way, but, um, but really the, the male is the protagonist. The hero of our Western tradition is always the, uh, the male. Okay, the Greco-Roman myths and the biblical narratives consistently depict women as weak, vulnerable, and again, as I mentioned earlier, culpable, that is responsible for in fact, the, uh, the, the problem of the problems of society. The woman's body, the, the, the energies are concentrated in Western art on the female body as somehow this shameful uh, object, even if it's desirable or necessary uh, for society to function. The female body, of course, is the subject of lots and lots of Western exploration uh, and as the locus of this imbalanced relationship between the genders. Um, we've noted many, many times in many, many contexts how in this painting the women are being raped. This is, of course, one of the origin myths of the Roman people, the great Roman Empire. Uh, the women are being, the Sabine women are being raped here, but they look like they are actually enjoying it. Um, this, this is, of course, violence being inflicted upon the female body, uh, and they don't seem like they're, you know, like they care at all. Of course, remember, this is the story told through the eyes of a male artist who is, again, reinforcing his status and his position in the society. And we see that constantly in Western art, over and over again, uh, that notion that somehow the woman is vulnerable, weak, and sexually available to a male protagonist. Whether it's in sculptures or paintings like this one, these violent myths, of which there are hundreds of them in both the Judeo-Christian tradition and the Greco-Roman traditions, hundreds of myths consistently place women in this secondary status, the status of victim and the subject of male violence so that the men can get their way and the men can maintain their power in the society. And I would, I would just add that the women have been the spoils of war for um, millennia, so that is a, a you know, a very um, 
difficult term for me to even speak spoils of war, but it's, it's a strategy and a tactic of how to win a war is to, you know, capture the women, enslave them, and violate them. And, and if we think that that's just ancient history, right, or myth, just look around the world today, and you see this consistently, that women are treated as chattel, basically, and definitely as spoils of war. Not just victims, but literally spoils to be traded, exchanged, abused, and degraded in any number of, of different ways. So this is a persistent myth, or a persistent uh, chronic situation in the world even today. Sometimes we get rare inversions of this, of this story. For example, this is indeed a myth from the, uh, the, uh, the Bible, the, uh, the, uh, the Hebrew Bible, uh, the story of Judith and Holofernes. And here we actually see that the women are protagonists and the men are the victims. But again, this is the exception, not the rule. This is, in fact, a unique case. And of course, what is the biggest difference that we see here? The artist is a female. So we have a, 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 the Renaissance painter, early Baroque painter, Artemisia Gentileschi, who's making the argument here, and totally inverting the, old, the, old, the, the, the chronic paradigm that we've inherited. The, that paradigm shifts and evolves no matter what style you're looking at, no matter who the artist is, uh, well into our own time. So even in pop art, we see images like this that depict women as vulnerable. And of course, the, the source for this painting by Roy Lichtenstein was, of course, the comics that are, you know, that reinforce these myths and the Marvel comics, et cetera, et cetera, that consistently, until relatively recently, continue to, uh, to purvey this notion that women are weak and vulnerable and subject to the males. Uh, men, not all, not all male artists, though, were, in fact, um, uh, you know, sort of complicit in this. Some of them actually quite understood the dynamic and actually alluded to it. Here, Gustav Klimt actually alludes to uh, women's power. Only here, the power is sexual and the power is destructive. It's a, a kind of castrating power. And there have been, in fact, uh, archetypes that have been created around powerful women. So, for example, the femme fatale of 19th century art is, in fact, one of these, um, these female archetypes. She is dangerous. She's ruthless. She's a, a, a figure to be feared, not so much respected for, uh, for her wielding power. Typically, though, the female body is objectified. Female bodies treated as an object, not as another subject or as another human being, but rather as an object. In modernist times, as an object of study, and that's great and it's dandy, but again, it puts the, 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 the female in a position of being uh, an object rather than a subject uh, in, her, in her own right. And that tradition, of course, persists in uh, contemporary art as well, into modern art, certainly, and into, um, uh, into modern times. The, uh, the figure here that de Kooning became famous for, this whole series, um, which is called the Woman Series, which must clearly be about gender and it must be about his notions of women and femininity and all that, is actually quite stark and quite shocking because what de Kooning did is actually he based his, this whole series, which is a kind of linchpin series in modern art, on the idea that woman is in fact a castrating bitch whose only purpose in life, besides creating life, is to actually destroy the male ego. And I mean, that tells us a world about de Kooning's own personal psychology. But it, again, reinforces these horrible myths about women's, women's roles. So now woman is actually vilified. And that, of course, goes back to antiquity. So these smiling, grimacing figures that we see in de Kooning's paintings are not just benign academic formal studies of beautiful color and line and pain and texture. These things are ideologically loaded with this image of woman as, in fact, a kind of ruthless creature, an uncontrollable creature whose purpose in life is to destroy men. This is, by the way, the pediment of a temple in ancient Greece that warned men. And notice that the Gorgon, with her smiling face, actually is holding it. It's broken off, but you can see a male figure there. So the message is the goddess here the female is here to destroy the man and to put the man in his place. An image of power, but also a demonization of the female. Um, can you go back to the de Kooning? I uh, wanted to point out also, because um, he spoke of this 
the, the legs, instead of being splayed as they are with the Gorgon, her knees are, are there's a slight gesture of demurity there, but it's, it's, it's a tease. And then he puts high heels on. So he, it was his term, he said, she's powerful, but she's silly. It was his way of making, also showing contempt by making her look, um, you know, also weak and ineffective, you know, in those high heels and looking kind of, yeah, it's a, oh, I'm just kidding kind of moment. John Graham, the, uh, the great modernist artist, um, painted a whole series of portraits of women with their eyes crossed. And when he was asked point blank, what, do the, what does that mean? Why, does, your, does your model have crossed eyes? And he said, no, that's, that's the gesture they make when I'm giving them an orgasm. The modernist male artist. Okay, so let's, let's shift our conversation now to the female model here. And, and by the way, there are two, uh, two very distinct categories that we talk about. When we talk about women in Western art, in the Western tradition, there's two very distinct categories. One category is the actual presence of women in the art world. How many of these women were artists? How many of them were models? How many of them were patrons of the arts? What was the actual role that women played in the whole trajectory of Western art? That's one concern. But the bigger concern, and I think this is true to feminists and people who study gender in the visual arts, the biggest concern is the representation of women in the arts, particularly if the arts are monopolized by men or have been systematically monopolized for thousands of years. So the way woman is represented is, in fact, a a key piece of this story. And so the, the female model actually is, um, is a central figure in, the, in Western art. And, um, and even though the female model was rare in the ancient world, we really don't know the circumstances in which, uh, in which artists studied the female body, studied the, the female in motion in order to render her in, uh, in the visual arts. Uh, the female model increasingly becomes an important subject in Western art, particularly after the Renaissance, so after 1400 in the Western world. In order to tell those narratives, you need to, to in fact, study the female body. And so that's, that's going to be the, the next uh, b part of this discussion, is to talk about that, uh, how that, uh, the, the female model and the nude, in fact, becomes a part of our Western tradition. So sculptures like these, and by the way, you'll notice this is the same sculpture. This is an ancient uh, sculpture done by the artist, the Greek artist Praxiteles. It was the most celebrated uh, uh, figure in the ancient world, female figure in the ancient world. And it was repeated hundreds, maybe thousands of times by uh, both Greek artists and Roman artists. So the original was probably a bronze, and then it was copied over and over again. Whether that, sub, that sculpture was made from the fantasy of Praxiteles, from his mind, invented, if you will, or whether it was based on the actual study of a female, we don't know. All we know is that the nude figure, that is the woman in, un, unclothed, was in fact invented by the Greeks. And the nude is in fact an archetype. It is a male, a straight male's version of what an ideal female should be. So this is not a, an image of a naked woman. This is, in fact, uh, by that I mean as a, as a real person. This is, in fact, an idealized woman, nude, unclothed. And so, therefore, it's filtered through the lens of the male artist. And that, again, is, is a paradigm. So, and again, you see the same pose, the same figure in various contexts repeated over and over and over again. And actually, Christy, why don't you say something about how the figure is, um, in some ways, displaying the body or the artist is displaying the body, but not really? Or what's happening here in terms of the dynamic of the, of the figure? Well, I, I, I guess just looking at those figures, I'll bet they had um, a model to look at. Um, but um, uh, there's always that gesture of modesty there. And then they did have uh, really mathematical formulas about what the what proportions were ideal you know based on um, sometimes they would study they would take 20 women and pick out what they thought was the ideal feature 
film all of those women and sort of make a composite ideal woman. And that is certainly true when you get to the Renaissance where there's a revival, if you will, of these ancient, more naturalistic depictions of art. So imagine in the Middle Ages we lose that capacity or desire to create figures that look lifelike, but in the Renaissance it becomes the obsession of artists like, Don uh, like Botticelli in this case. And notice that this figure is in fact an image of an actual person. This is, we know this is his mistress slash lover, uh, but it's also he's putting her in the guise of the ancient goddess Venus and putting her in actually in the pose of the sculpture that you just see here that sort of modest you know, covering and still revealing the body. So he's clearly bragging about how beautiful her body is, at the same time giving her a certain degree of modesty. Um, yeah, this is, I, I always call this Venus on a half shell. It's the, the origin, the birth of Venus uh, as she's sort of emerging out of the froth of the sea. Okay, but this is actually more typical of Renaissance nudes. And that is, uh, this is Titian's famous Venus of Urbino. And again, that whole question of modesty versus availability, sort of sexual availability for, if you think about it, for male eyes, for the male gaze, that's really what the, that's at, at the core question around this, this image. To what extent is the artist revealing a person, a real person, or to what extent is he constructing an image of an idealized person in an idealized setting, in an idealized pose or configuration? All of those questions are relevant. We don't have the specific answers here. But we know, for example, that in these, uh, this painting, uh, Titian painted this, I think, I believe six times, maybe seven times. And all of those paintings went straight into the boudoirs of Western European kings and monarchs. And in some cases, they went into their erotic collections. We know in the case of the Spanish king, he had a whole room full of these nudes. So these images also verged on the pornographic. And there was an, the agenda of pornography behind many of these images. And just remember this image when we get to Monet and his painting of, called Olympia. There are these weird aberrations that also happen along the way. For example, this is, these are the, sculpt, the famous sculptures uh, in, the, in, uh, uh, by, in Florence by Michelangelo Buonarroti. And uh, as one of my... These are what are known as viragos, that is masculinized females, bodybuilder types, you know, sort of Schwarzenegger-ish looking females. And uh, I, I'll never forget being in a graduate seminar at the University of Chicago where my friend and colleague Daffy stood up and said, but those aren't women, those are men with boobs. She nailed it, right, because Michelangelo never had a female model. So his models were all males and in fact he basically masculinized these, or created these females that are their, their male bodies with breasts, missing male genitalia. So very bizarre uh, case studies. And actually, I would like you to talk about this painting. Because this, <laughs> is, this was your choice to put this in the... In the well, um, this is a painter named Boucher, and um, I think I've got that right. And, uh, this is actually an etching made, probably done from the painting, but in this case, it's just it's just out and out, you know, pornography. Um, it's not a Venus. The name of this uh, painting is called Mrs. Miller, and so it's it's cl clearly you know a um, it looks sort of like a brothel scene, and um, and uh, she, they, in, in during the Renaissance to do a female nude, they generally had to pick a theme from Greek or Roman mythology because they weren't going to have any uh, Christian uh, religious themes with, with naked women. But, but they wanted to draw them, so it was the birth of Venus. Um, but in this case, it's this sort of a strumpet kind of piece. So there's a kind of odd frankness in this image from the late 18th century. Um, woman is seen as an object of desire. Woman is seen as, as the, a, a kind of pornographic catalyst, right? To sexual arousal in the, uh, in the, in the straight male. Um, and there is no cover here, which is really unusual because almost always that myth, that veneer of the mythology is a cover for the depiction of the female body in a kind of pornographic uh, context. So a pretty potent image, I would say. 
But also this is a, a transitional age if you think about the late 18th century. A lot of things are, are changing in, uh, in European uh, art and certainly European society in general. And then in the 19th century though, we have a kind of hardening in some ways, a kind of ossifying of the, the, that patriarchal structure. So this is uh, uh, Ang's um, wonderful image of the Turkish bath. And here, Orientalism is used as an excuse. That's, that's part of the veneer. In order to display the female body sort of in, in abundance. It had to go to an exotic culture. Another culture, Another yeah. culture. In this case, we're looking at a harem, a, a harem, if you will. Uh, so where women could lounge around. And this is, of course, what women always do when they're together, right? This. <laughs> They just lounge around and you know luxuriate in their in their beautiful bodies. Yeah, this is actually a, a, a chilling image, and we we ran across this image and we like it like laughed at it, cried at it. I mean, it is. Uh, but this is in fact the paradigm, if you will, uh, where you have male artists who have easy access to the female body through the salon, the academy, the schooling. The, 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 it's set up for this relationship. Uh, it's a it's a quite a chilling image, and actually on that uh, uh, related to that image, I want to use a quotation. Both Christy and I uh, have read this article numerous times, and we look at it as a kind of key piece. This is Linda Nochlin's "Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists," uh, which was published in 1970, uh, a, a piece that transformed gender relationships in uh, in the visual arts, and certainly in the in the category of art criticism. Nochlin said. Far more believable, unfortunately, was the complete unavailability to aspiring women artists of any nude models at all. It is all right for a woman to reveal herself naked as an object for a group of men, but forbidden that a woman participate in the, the active study and recording of naked as an object of men and women. To be deprived of this ultimate state of training meant to be deprived of the possibility of creating major art. In other words, the bias wasn't just to provide men what they needed in art. It was also to keep women from having access to both the male body or the female body or access to art education. And that way, the artist, the great artist, can only be men because men have full access to both the female body and the male body, and they can do the nude studies, the life models. And it, it goes, it needs to be stated that st studying uh, from the life model was the bedrock of training as an artist from the Renaissance on. And, and so you, and, and the nature of painting then was mainly um, large um, public works that were either historical paintings, you know. Religious subjects. Re religious subjects or uh, maybe some major portraits, but they weren't paintings, small paintings that were in homes. They were in public places, so it could be, you know, Rembrandt's, was it the Night Watch, or um, the surrender of Cornwallis at Yorktown. You know, <laughs> people needed to know how to draw the figure. And um, so it's, it's a little bit, uh, you know, if, you, if a woman, in that time, let's, it's equivalent to a woman wanting to be a doctor and told, oh yeah, but you can't go to medical school, and, and, and if you couldn't, you couldn't study anatomy anyway, so. You know. It's crippling. It's a crippling exclusion. Here we have this, uh, this somewhat grotesque example of the paradigm continuing well into the 20th century. This is the German artist Ivo Salinger, and by the way, who owned this painting? Adolf Hitler owned this painting. But it's not like we're immune to this conversation in the United States as well. So this is, this is a very interesting contrast between Edward Hopper on the left, who's one of those few male artists who, in fact, I think treated his subjects, his, his female models, not as objects, but as actual human beings. So there's a little painting there on the left that you can see. It's actually not a little painting, but it's just a small on the screen. And then, of course, the, uh, the image on the right. And why don't you tell us about that, why this image is in this, in this PowerPoint? Well, this is Thomas Hart Benton, and it, it's called <clears throat> uh, the, the Rape of Persephone. So it is, again, going to the myth of Persephone, the daughter of um, the earth goddess Demeter. And she's uh, abducted by Hades into the underground every winter, abducted 
you know, not willingly. So that's why we have winter, but every spring she returns. And so um, this is Persephone um, returning in the spring. And um, as interpreted by Thomas Hart Benton, and I found this in a book of American art that was in my family's bookshelf, one of the few art books. And, and when I opened to that page, I, I mean, I, it's burned in my memory. It was shocking. And it was shocking because I knew something bad was happening. And I, maybe I was nine years old or something, but I didn't talk about it to my parents because I didn't want them to know I was pouring through this book and that this image was very, very disturbing. And um, in any case, it is the opportunity for him to do this um, highly idealized nude. And it's the same old paradigm from, from ancient times. This is, a, uh, so as, as Christy rightly called it, it is a nude. Again, it's that ancient archetype that is a, a woman's body filtered through the ideological lens of the male artist. So that's what makes this figure a nude figure on the right, and also Correggio's image on the left, which was the predecessor image for this. Uh, those are nude figures. They're not naked women. They are, in fact, nude figures because they, are, they fall right into that, uh, that, parad that ancient paradigm. There were artists who, in fact, tried very hard to destroy that paradigm. And we think that Manet is actually one of these uh, key figures. That is a straight male artist who, in some ways, undermines this idea, the concept of the nude. These are not nude figures here. These are naked women. And that's why these paintings were horrors in the context of the, the French Salon in the 19th century. The audience went crazy when they saw these paintings. The affront of these women. How could they be just thrust at us with particular, how could they look back at us with this particular gaze? And yeah, it's the gaze. If you remember the um, Venus of Urbino, she's looking quite fetching. And this woman whose name, his model is Victorine Morant. Victorine was a fam favorite model of, of both Manet and Degas, but she really looks straight back at the viewer with Sang foi, I would just say. <laughs> With chutzpah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and she has a, you know, she has the little necklace. She has slippers on. These are, it contribute to the fact that she's a human being and not an archetype or a metaphor for Venus, you know. And, um, and the luncheon on the grass, I don't know if you have, there, that, that grouping comes from an ancient painting but it, it kind of throws, um, it, it just throws a lot of social propriety and conventions. Uh, it, you know, he just, you know, confronts people w with that. And uh, I will say that Victorine was a, a very accomplished artist on, on her own and was accepted in the Paris salons no less than six times, but we don't know much more. That's right. We remember Edouard Manet and Edgar Degas, it, it but we don't remember in, her. I heard a, some comment, always a model, never an artist. And, and we do have a number of models in our group who, have, who create art. And um, uh, anyway, she was uh, an artist who uh, was uh, probably supported herself by modeling. Okay, so this is, in general, the context in the 19th century where male artists en masse had access to the male body as a, uh, as a, as a subject. Uh, they also had access to the female model. The works like the one that you see here on the right by Klimt were only made because the artists had access to the female body. And actually, that's, that's an expression we don't like to use. Well, access, access to, to the body. Access to a female model. Right. Um, and Women, of course, were restricted uh, when they were allowed into the uh, academies and into the, the private salons. They were allowed to study the female body, but not necessarily the male body. Uh, and of course, they were segregated from male students. And here we see, in fact, a painting of women drawing the female body. But again, this is, a, this is an unusual situation. It's certainly not the norm in the 19th century. And I, I will just, if you, 
for Mark. I will be talking about the artist Thomas Aikens. This, this is a painting of one of his uh, art classes that he taught at the Philadelphia Academy, Pennsylvania Academy of Art. But when he got there, they did segregate the female students from the, the uh, male students, and the female students could only draw from a female model or animals. So on that note, I'm going to pass the baton here to Christy, who's going to talk to us about Thomas Aikens. I can pull up the slides for you too. Oh, um, I will also just say about the women drawing from animals, which was permitted. One of the great painters of the 19th century was Rosa Bonheur, who made an extremely successful career drawing animals painting and drawing grand paintings of animals, and most notably horses. And um, the women who did uh, break, break out and succeed before they had access to um, even being able to um, study art um, usually were uh, daughters of artists in most cases. And that was true of Rosa Bonheur and Artemisia Genileski. But anyway, Thomas Aikens is a Philadelphia um, native who was born in 1844. And um, he came from a solid middle class family who supported him studying in Paris and Spain. And he had uh, great access to life model uh, training there, which as, as a t young 20 something artist, aspiring artist, and I think that affected his painting for the rest of his life and his commitment to having uh, life studies available to all students. But this is one of his most famous paintings. Um, and uh, this is a famous Philadelphia surgeon in giving uh, a lesson in surgery. And this painting was, um, shocking to the Philadelphia community because he showed uh, blood on the uh, hand of the uh, great surgeon who's holding a scalpel and there's blood on the scalpel and his fingers. And um, apparently this is the relative of the patient here shielding her eyes. Um, so he, he was very, very, um, maybe I should have that. Uh, he, he was very, very committed to um, honesty and realism in his paintings. He was, he was going to show the blood when there was surgery. Anyway, he, this is Thomas Eakins. Uh, he not only um, had male and female nude models in his class, he, um, Photography was uh, now uh, really uh, coming into its own, and he used photography as an aid. He was familiar with uh, Edward Moybridge, who did studies. And I mean, he did things that now professors wouldn't get away with. He had his, he posed nude. He had his students pose nude for each other. This is him um, carrying a body, a female body, probably a study to, to be used for a painting. Um, and um, you see the photograph to the, uh, what would be on your left, um, that were, were used for studies of paintings that he did. And this is him down in the water here. He sometimes includes himself in paintings. I would say, in general, he's not known for doing uh, nudes, but he um, did champion the study because he wanted his figures to look real and authentic. And so he poses in that classic declining nude figure um, and then has his model. This is a pose that we see so often in history of painting. In a, in a way, his his photographs are more um, reminiscent. The photographs he chose to use were more um, 
romantic <laughs> uh, and idealized than anything that he painted. But this is one of his paintings of the nude, and in this case, it's the, a painting in the studio of um, a sculptor named William Rush, and the title is William Rush Carving His Allegorical Figure of the Schuylkill River. And so um, the sculptor is there, the model is posing for him, and, uh, and Aikens is drawing this model as a real human being and not as an allegorical figure. And there is a, a, um, a tradition that I was unaware of, but this woman here is the chaperone. So apparently in cases where there would be a, a private um, studio, you know, a, a, a young female model in the stu private studio, there would be a chaperone. And, um, This is a drawing that Thomas Eakins did of a model um, life mo from life. And um, the other thing he did to protect, protect the identity of the model uh, in these classroom classes was he would um, put a uh, mask over the model's face. It was to protect her identity. Um, and he, um, he encouraged so he encouraged um, tr uh, people to model. He wa wanted to make it not of uh, only the profession of the demi monde. You know, he he wanted respectable young men and women to to pose. I think he was an idealist and even ahead of our time. <laughs> you know, but um, he, he believed it and he paid for it. He he got dismissed from his position at the Pennsylvania. Academy of Art for removing the loincloth from a male model when there were women present in the class. And then that was in 1897, in and then he again got fired in 1895 for the same offense from the Drexel Institute. Uh, his students rallied to his defense, but he was forced to resign. Um, and so he was, um, I don't think he would have been an easy person to live with. <laughs> and I would say as much as he wanted that equality in the classroom, I think he, he married uh, one of his students who was a very uh, aspiring and good artist, Susan McDowell, and, and she was a very good painter, but we of course don't know much about her. So um, I... Uh, We'll just see if there's anything else you want to say about Thomas Aikens. I would say I, I have studied him a lot because uh, I went to school in Philadelphia and he was a hero, paint, heroic painter in, um, in Philadelphia and I got to see a lot of his original uh, paintings. So a very interesting case study of a male artist who in some ways tried to really buck this uh, pervasive paradigm that we've been discussing um, uh, uh, for a while now. So there, but there were, he's not, Aikens was not alone. Particularly in the 20th century, there were a number of figures, artists who in some ways tried to buck this, this trend and tried to in some ways to humanize the female model. So for example, the famous painter, the French painter Georges Rouault, um, would also try to humanize his subjects. But it, I'm glad you mentioned the term the demi-monde because so often the model is identified with the infra-world, that is the lowest classes, and, and often associated with prostitution, particularly in France in the 19th century. So we don't know if indeed these women are prostitutes, but the premise the, is, that they, is indeed that they were. So the models are treated like human beings, but there's still people who are thought of as in lower class because of that, uh, because of the, their profession. Uh, I think Jose Clemente Orozco, uh, Orozco, the Mexican painter, also d uh, worked very, very hard to treat his, uh, his uh, females in his paintings uh, as, uh, as human beings, not as, in fact, objects of study or as lesser beings. And I would just point out, because this is a good example, what I've noticed in a lot of 
not all, but in a lot of um, paintings by male artists, the point of view is often from from above. If not, you know, not that's a pretty dramatic. Above. But it it makes the the um, figure then in, inferior. The, the eye of the viewer is looking down on on the figure. Um, we think of one of the one of the masters of 20th century um, figurative art, of course, is Lucian Freud, the descendant of Sigmund Freud, um, who has a certain frankness to both the male and the female body. Uh, but it's particularly his images of women that are striking because how uh, how they cut against the the traditions of the female body as idealized, the female body as representative of beauty or allegory or myth. Um, he, there's a certain frankness here that leads us to, to call these not, uh, not nude studies, but naked studies. These are, in fact, naked human beings is what we're looking at here. Well, and I, I also think um, he was equally, let's say, uncomplimentary <laughs> to male, uh, his paintings of male uh, nudes. I would say um, also I see it coming now a real effort to not idealize the human figure. In fact, to go to great lengths to, to show just how flawed and, um, you know. Raw. Raw. <laughs> every, every mole, every, every broken vein is there. And also, you know, this, uh, some, in some cases, the really over, oversized, very fleshy women although we have this other, you know, model here. And so it's, I don't know, it's almost an, to me, it goes to the other extreme. But one rationale I've heard, I'm not sure I totally absorbed it, but that by, by picking less than ideal models, they also were able to escape the um, accusation of objectifying you know, in that playboy model way. Uh, uh, right. this, this is for the eyes of uh, the enticing, beautiful object for the heterosexual male, the male. They're clearly not uh, creating figures that are uh, uh, beautiful, idealized. So they're not, they're not abetting that paradigm that, that really the only females you see in art are supposed to be beautiful, are supposed to be ideal, but rather they're, they are who they are. Humans. They're just humans, yeah. Okay, so now let's shift away from these kind of exceptional male artists who did exceptional things with the figure and talk about exceptional female artists. And really, it's only after second wave feminism where we see an active body of women in the, uh, in the art world who in fact begin to champion the female body and the male body through their eyes, through their skills, through their talents, their craftsmanship. And so in some ways, the figure comes back into art in the late 60s and in the early 70s in a very, very big way at the hands now of women artists, women who in some ways feel free to critique and free themselves from the patriarchal structures. One of these artists is Sylvia Slay, who in some ways turns the tables on, on that tradition of art, of the, the orientalist image that we saw earlier, where you have a bevy of beauties lounging around. Here, she has a bevy of uglies male bodies lounging around. But unlike that tradition, Slay is in fact saying, okay, I'm not going to treat these bodies as idealized, beautiful uh, objects. I'm gonna treat them as, in the raw, uh, as the raw human beings that they are. So in some ways she does, she does turn the tables. It's a woman artist now doing male nudes, but she's not going to dehumanize these figures in the same way that the 19th century artists dehumanized the female. And it, it's also a comment on the kind of painting that we saw in the Turkish bath by Ang. You know, it was um, pointing to, you know, what, what this is sort of like, if, if I was going to try to do that, what would I do? And, you know, imagine, you know, imagine the creation of this. Yeah, and the one model on the, um, that side. <laughs> The left Far is, left. Uh, uh, has a guitar, which is also the woman in the bath scene has a, is playing, uh, looks like a lute. 
so it's definitely referencing that painting. She's clearly referencing and critiquing the old paradigms of Western art. Notice, for example, how Velazquez's painting inspires this painting, and it's, by the way, the same model holding the guitar in the other painting. She also puts herself in the image now. So she's saying, I'm the person who's in control of the representation of the male body in this case. And I can choose to either idealize that body or present that body as roughly, as crudely as it, as it is in, in real life. So it's an amazing sort of archetypal shift here when the woman is in fact in control of the, uh, of the figure. And of course, there's no one does it better than Alice Neal in terms of commanding the form, whether that form be a child, an older person, whether that person be male or female, she just embraced the figure and portraiture with this kind of frankness and honesty and sincerity that is really refreshing to see in, in the art of the 20th century. Think about how different Alice Neal is from a Willem de Kooning. How the modernist, great superstar genius artist, in fact, continues that process of dehumanizing the model. And that's, of course, not what you see in Alice Neal. And that tradition, by the way, fortunately continues well beyond uh, feminism into third wave feminist artists, including Jenny Seville. So there is, again, this approach to the, uh, to the form uh, with a kind of frankness and vivacity that, that we expect from uh, the best painters, whether they're male or female. And we're going to wrap this, this discussion here by talking about the sense of woman as, uh, as artist and as protagonist and in some ways as shaper and commenter and, uh, and, uh, uh, and insightful thinker about what it means to be human to express the human condition through the body or through the figure. So Kiki Smith is one of my heroes. And here, this is actually a self-portrait uh, self and an image of her husband. So these are, in fact, the, the sculpture is her body and his body. And notice how we began with this whole question of gender differentiation or parity or the lack of parity between the genders in Western art. Well, I think this is a comment on that, an attempt in some ways to find parity between us. There is also a flattening of the figure here. These figures are not excited. They're not you know, emotional. They're, they're just, it's just presented in their pure rawness. And on that note, I want uh, Christy to talk about her own approach to the male and the female model together. Because now we have a protagonist artist who, in fact, can control, can manage the, uh, the representation of both. So Christy, why don't you tell us about these two works and then we will okay. um, wrap it up and open up for Q&A. I will just briefly say that this also recalls to me the expulsion from the garden. They, these, their bowed heads, they're not hiding themselves in shame, but it's basically, they're not heroic. They're, 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 they're flawed humans, but there's that sense of, um, it, it recalls a re, re re-examining that kind of expulsion of Adam and Eve imagery. Um, I would say that um, out, once I, outside of academia, I had a hard time finding a, 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 bit, a, a way to draw the figure. That there, there are very few figure drawing groups at, once you graduate from college. And so when I found the Patty Cannon group, it was a godsend to me because I loved drawing the figure and it was um, affordable and it met twice a month regularly. And when I joined, uh, it had been agreed by the group that they would just have uh, female models, which was fine with me. And I was working there for several years and really gaining more and more um, confidence with the figure and I started this series of large paintings that um, are approximately four feet by six feet each. So the figures are actually larger than life when you see the painting. And I did want to use a male model. And so I, we're sort of ending with that. We, the topic is gender and the life model. And as a female artist uh, hiring a male model, it is, um, I think it's a relatively small club, uh, you know, to hire the model. You could go to a class and have a male model, but to hire a male model for your own studio practice is fair. I'd never done it before. <laughs> and so it was some trepidation that I started looking for a male model. And um, everything about 
uh, the life model situation. There's protocols that inspire trust, and you know the model is clothed until they step into the position where they will be posing for you. You never touch the model. You give verbal directions to um, change poses. And there are periodic breaks to give the model a rest. Anyway, it's a well-established protocol. Uh, in, in private studios, I mean, I did not have a chaperone there. Um, and I found, I had to find, I, there aren't many male models, let's put it that way, and um, far fewer. And um, so to find a male model who, um, I was comfortable with and, and who I wanted to have a certain middle-aged thickness <laughs> to their body, not, but, not, but not a total dad bod. <laughs> so um, I had, I had a, um, something, something in mind, but when I found this model, it, it was just, it was, it was comfortable. He was comfortable with the situation and um, it's a complete role reversal in terms of our paradigm of the man, in this case, is in the most vulnerable position a man can probably imagine. In, in, and I'm, I'm running the show. I'm uh, calling the shots and saying when we have a break and what the pose is and what I want. And I had to just take that on and say, yeah, I'm in charge. Also, it was sort of a rite of passage for me to hire a model for myself, because it costs money, and you have to say, it's worth it. I mean, it's cost me more money than to, we have very affordable to go to Nancy's um, drawing session. So anyway, I, I just wanted to explain that um, is, as a gender dynamic, having a, a male model was um, uh, a, a challenge, and then ultimately, in this case, a rewarding experience for me in terms of getting a model who um, there was mutual trust and um, he was he he just when I said pretend you're standing in water <laughs> and it was convincing you know, have to ha they have to have imagination and talent these models we there it's not easy and then um, the one on the left is um, from that series. And I would say that in this case, I did not have a male and female model in my studio at the same time. I, I posed him leaning against something. And then I had this all in my mind. Then I, in a separate session, I hired the female model and had her lean against something. And I said, I want you to just look exhausted. And um, so that spread leg position, you know, for, the, for a female model using that position was, was sort of this sort of um, erotic invitation. In this case, it's not exactly um, man spreading. <laughs> for, it was just that moment of exhaustion. And I didn't want her with splayed legs. I, I, uh, and he, he was fine with this. And, um, uh, so that um, so that piece is, is slightly larger than life, and um, I felt like uh, that series just was. Uh, it, I I actually uh, I don't know. It, it was just a, a unique experience for me, and a very very rewarding experience, and. Um, in terms of getting to a point as in, in the realm of art history, I would say it just was very good to know that at this point, and this was in around the year 2000, that I could hire a male model and make my own decisions uh, and create these works uh, that were um, a bit subversive in terms of the tradition of uh, Western painting. And I think any time any of, any of us women who are painting the nude figure, male or female, uh, there is an element of subversion. There can be an element of subversion in it because 
you are challenging this, the long freight train of history. And, um, and it's an opportunity to point these uh, hypocrisies and weaknesses out and make it your strength. Thank you, Chrissy. And on that note, let's, um, let's open up for a couple questions before we take our break. So yes, there's a question right here. Is that Sherry? I just want to say that uh, along the lines of what Christy was talking about, in the late 90s, I hired a local artist who was modeling for other, other artists, a male. And it, it was so uncomfortable. He came insisting that my husband had to be home. He was in my own personal studio. Uh, he charged twice as much as what we were paying our, our group model. And he insisted on wearing a little protective pocket on a string because he didn't want to be completely nude in front of me, a woman alone. And I was, like Chrissy, directing traffic on what, how I wanted him to pose. The energy was so negative in that experience, I ended up not using any of the drawings ever, ever, because it wasn't, it was just uncomfortable. And even though I had the position of power, um, it was really uncomfortable. <laughs> just want to say that. And I, I, I had to, you know, go through a couple of different models before I found the one where it was comfortable. And um, so it, it's, it's a, not so much, it's a testament to, to our, our, our history, really. Um, I can understand why a guy would feel uncomfortable. But, you know, it's... Yeah, it's that role reversal that just kind of wrenches and, things. And it is a power dynamic. We have to remember that. And this is what makes the female artist in control a power dynamic, a, a, sh a shift from the traditional power. Uh, power doesn't rest where it, where it should rest, right, with the male uh, protagonist. Yeah, Meg. Why don't we repeat the question in case yeah. the mics don't This was up. a question, why did the uh, Patty Cannon Salon make the decision to have only female models? And um, I don't know totally that, and Leslie might have a little bit more to say about that in her talk, but I do know that, um, from what I understand, they did hire a male model once, and it was just what uh, Sherry talked about. It was just too uncomfortable. You know, eight women standing around. It's like that, you remember that shot of all those men standing around that one woman? It's, it's um, at this point in our history, it's, it's quite uncomfortable. Yes. I just want to ask that, what I know about it too, is that it's, it was a woman's group, it was a woman's group of stuff, and myself, I self-censor in that situation. And it can be the greatest guy in the world. Um, it, it, it just is um, kind of um, automatic because for me, it's part of my training to, you know, in order to be safe in the world, I have to have a certain amount of armor. And even, even when it's not necessary, but but also, I've, I'm sure the same is true. Male conversation is amongst men is going to be different. And so that is a very good reason why that happened. In the same vein, how did the dynamics change from your experience uh, if the model was gay, male or female? I don't think that we've experienced any difference in in that situation. Um, we never asked. <laughs> <laughs>
I never, I, I never experienced any tension uh, of any kind when we had a, uh, an all-female group. Um, so. It was like we were women, the, the, and and I know that it's it's hard for people in the society to think without thinking about sex in any situation. But being a gay woman modeling for other women does not bring any kind of odd differences or sexual differences or anything because that's not female focus in particular in the situation. We are just women. I just want to let, let me let me add by saying that I, I I like the way you characterize. There's sort of good space, and then there's this bad space, this negative space. I think there's clearly a prurient interest in in the body, and that often leads to that kind of negative space. Uh, this exhibition, for example, could not be uh, held in many places in the state of Montana because community standards are so, so radically different from Missoula, Montana, and the University of Montana. So um, it, it's just because in, in many contexts, this exhibition would be seen as pornographic or would be seen as, as purely prurient in, its, uh, in, its, in, in what it's putting out there. Uh, so we have to be conscious of the fact that, yeah, this is a, it's a question of cultural perception of the role of the figure and, a fr and, 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 and embrace of the, of, the, of the body. So we uh, unfortunately have run out of time for this part of the program, so I think we better uh, wrap it up. There's going to be more opportunities for Q&A. So thank you for your questions. Thank you, Christy. Um, and let's take a 15-minute break, come back here uh, to hear from Leslie Van Staveren-Millar talk about the Patty Canyon Ladies Salon. Thank you.